Hello, everyone. Uh, thanks heaps for taking the time to join today's SmartCap webinar. Uh, in our webinar series, usually we draw on SmartCap's many years of experience and take a really deep dive into a particular area and share what we've learned and what our customers have learned to help inform the industry. Uh, I'm super excited that for today's event, I'm joined by Paul Moyner, the CEO of CommitWorks. So thanks heaps for being here with us today, Paul. Oh, thank you very much, Dan. It's um, it's, an, it's really an honour and I'm excited to be part of it. Oh, we're excited to have you. Uh, but before I pick your brain, uh, I just want to cover off some housekeeping stuff. Uh, to the audience who's joining us live, uh, please be aware that both the audio and the video today is being recorded, uh, which means a couple of things. Uh, firstly, you can sit back and relax. You don't need to write down any pearls of wisdom that Paul shares with us. The video will be posted to LinkedIn and YouTube for you shortly. Um, but what recording also means is that if you do post a question that we read, or if you choose to, jo choose to join in the conversation today, your voice will also be recorded, so please keep that in mind. Uh, outside of that, uh, you should all see on your webinar control panel the opportunity to post a question, to raise your hand, or to contribute to the live chat. So I'll do my best to keep my eye on all my little boxes, uh, and I'll bring your question into the conversation or bring your audio into the conversation as soon as I see it. Um, lastly, just in terms of format for today, because we're joined with Paul uh, and because in these webinars we really like to get into the detail, I've chosen to share my questions in advance with Paul so that he can bring a little bit of content for us today so that we can get into the detail. Um, and I haven't seen his responses, so I'm super excited. So let's uh, get to it. Paul, yeah, you and I have met. No, 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 no need to apologize. I'm, I'm excited. I get to see it with the audience today. Yeah, uh, great. You and I have met before, Paul. We've met in Brisbane, and I think it was also in Vancouver that we've met. Um, and beyond that, of course, I'm also familiar with CommitWorks, given that, much like SmartCap, it's a fellow member of the Jollymont family of fantastic technology businesses. Um, yeah. But it'd be great if you could first set the scene for the audience by sharing a little bit about yourself. Uh, and if you could share a little bit about CommitWorks, please. Yeah, great. So, um, yeah, I came prepared with the what is the CommitWorks story. So, uh, thanks for that lead in, Dan. Um, uh, we do get around a bit, don't we? Brisbane, <laughs> Canada, different parts of the world. So yeah, we do. Not any, but not anymore, <laughs> unfortunately. Um, so, yeah, so look, I, I came into CommitWorks um, because I used to be a management consultant that would go around and do what some people call management operating system projects for companies like Proudfoot and that kind of thing, and uh, partners and performance, et cetera. And so what we would generally do is build these spreadsheets and whiteboards that would help to um, get people organized so that they could commit to the work they were going to do every day and then go and do it. And you know, the idea behind all that is that um, large groups of people that are organized uh, tend to perform um, more productively and, and also safe, more safely than people that aren't organized before they go to work. And so um, I was working underground in a coal mine in Queensland and I, uh, you know, building spreadsheets and whiteboards for people and then trying to get supervisors to use them um, fairly, sometimes successfully, not always. Um, and then uh, I came across this this bit of software which had been implemented recently at another mine. And I was like, wow, this looks really great. I, I, um, I need to, you know, I need to understand this a bit more. And I got on a demo with, um, with this guy, Alex Retzlaff, who, had built the software with his team and um, and we you know we headed off and, and started working together so that's sort of uh, how it all all began and um, you know one of the things that um, I've you know kind of whether, whether you're using spreadsheets or software or, or whatever I think um, something that I've always liked the idea of is that people that make commitments to each other and then deliver on them tend to produce better results than and and if and if you can create a system or a process or a mechanism by which that can happen over and over again day by day, then um, then you should be able to get uh, improvements in, in performance. And so that's really what we as a business have set out 
to do is to build a set of products that that take people, the supervisor, the short-term planner, etc., away from this world where they're surrounded by you know spreadsheets and whiteboards and lean boards and pieces of paper mm. and all these disconnected tools that they need to the, the kind of the onus is on them to understand all that stuff and know what's going on so that they can integrate it all into their own brains and then make good decisions um, to a world where that stuff is actually um, it's the, the integration is done for them in in software in on on screen so they can actually see all the things that are going to go on on any particular day and um, and and manage their collaborate with each other and manage the work that needs to be done um, effectively so that, that that's the journey we've been we've been on from the beginning you know building in, instead of having whiteboards we've got big touch screens in public places that people use to interact with the software instead of you know putting stuff into a spreadsheet to build a plan you put it into fusion or you get and we get the data from sap or whatever it is so so we, we kind of our, our job is to try to make it easier for people to be organized every day in the workplace. Yeah, fantastic. So uh, two follow-ups on that. I assume if we were to walk into your office behind you right now, we wouldn't see a whole bunch of whiteboards standing up there with, uh, <laughs> with removable ink all over them? You, you actually would because I think they, they have different purposes, <laughs> right? So in my to my left i have a whiteboard but that's for it's not for planning so much and, and organizing day-to-day -day work it's for helping people collaborate and think so i think whiteboards are really great for that to help people kind of look at something together but but they're not very good at um, integrating between departments so if you've got a whiteboard in one office and a whiteboard in another office they don't talk to each other and so um you know, you can't have a plan on a whiteboard in one office and a plan on a whiteboard on the other and be able to kind of compare whether you're going to have a clash between those whiteboards. It doesn't work that way. So so I think the one of the things we've really tried to do in our software is to um, respect the social activity that the that the people are needing to do. You know, like the reason you have a DWAP, you know, daily weekly operating plan board in a public place is so the people that care about the work can stand in front of it and talk about it well mm. it doesn't you know so so that still needs that that activity still needs to happen but it's much better if that data and the information that has got there has got there in some kind of integrated way without people having to write it up at 7 a.m. in the morning because, you know, from a piece of paper that they printed from some other thing or, you know what I mean? Like, yeah, yeah. Uh, so, so, so you still want the social human process, but you also want it to be integrated and, and digitized and communicated to people all over the place. Does that make sense? Yeah, it makes perfect sense, and it's a good a good justification for having a whiteboard in your office. So so well played. Um, yeah, one of our guys, Terry Terry, just whiteboard behind his desk, and every every meeting I look at it and go, really, we yeah. should get that into Jira or, or into PipeDrive or something like that. But you know what? Uh, whiteboards are the they they're helpful for thinking. I don't don't think I could live without a whiteboard. Amelia will attest uh, nor that. Could I. Right yeah. b beside the staged pot plant in my office here is a big glass wall, <laughs> and I, I use that as my whiteboard. So I, I'm on board with that as well. Um, Good. The the common failing for myself with whiteboards, um, apart from the fact that they don't talk across across rooms or parts of the business, is um, my handwriting is terrible. And I've seen whiteboards in 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 crib rooms and and uh, muster rooms at mines where, yeah, the handwriting is illegible. But apart from the obvious flaw of the whiteboard system, um, in your in your experience, and I'm, I'm moving on to another sort of topic here, is is there in like a common mistake that businesses are making? Is there something that, that businesses like mines, like transport companies, or like businesses like ours, that are consistently doing, doing wrong, that are a bit problematic for productivity? Yeah, look, I, I mean, I think the word wrong is a little bit um, possibly problematic, but um, mm. like I think everyone's doing their best and with what the, the kind of tools they've got. Um, and um, I remember seeing some 
uh, you know, when I first started doing this consulting work, they had this little cartoon of a guy, um, and it was obviously the, the the chief, and he was standing there with a sword, and he was like off to battle, but and there was these two guys standing next to him going, "Here, look, we've got this um, we've got this machine gun, um, we'd like to share with you." And uh, and and he's like, no, 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 not right, not right now. I'm far too busy, you know. Um, and so I think that, that you know, had had he rolled out that machine gun, he might have found that uh, his battle had gone a little easier. But um, so I think I think everyone's busy. Everyone's using the tools that they they kind of are familiar with and are comfortable with. Um, uh, and but you know, there are very very large organizations, one of the, you know, in this set of photos I've got here just shows kind of typical tools. This is, this organization here had spent, when they were part of um, a larger organization, spent three and a half billion dollars on SAP implementation, you know, and yet still this, um, this photo, you know, to go to the daily planning meeting, um, she would take a photo of the whiteboard behind her desk and then printed out A3 so that she knew all of the different um, uh, headings or cuts or, or locations that they were going to be mining when they were going to be there and when they were moving. So that was basically their short-term plan was on that whiteboard. And, and the mechanism for collaborating with that was to take a photo of it and bring it to the daily planning meeting. <laughs> oh, come on. <laughs> no, like, and, and, but yet they've spent three and a half billion dollars on SAP. So, you know, like, um, so, so the, 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 I guess the, the, the comment I would make is that there's been heaps of money, so much money spent on, on, um, on software and, and transducers, software for, for planning the kind of the, um, the short to medium to long term mm -hmm. of work. So we we're going to cut through this block of coal at this rate, and it's going to be it'll be you know we're going to start on Tuesday and finish next Friday. Okay, great. That's really useful information. Um, and 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 a mining engineer needs to know that, and they need to know that then they're going to go somewhere else because they've got to plan the dumps and the digs and all this stuff. That's fine. But and then there's a whole lot of information and and data coming off machines, you know, for fleet management systems. So so there's kind of like all this management information and all this machine information. But the mm. the stuff that you got you've got to practically give to the guys who are going to go and execute the work every day, is is still in a lot of places done on on whiteboards and spreadsheets, you know, like like these. Mm. You know, that was my job was building these things. You know, I had a a few rolls of that kind of black sticky tape in my pocket at almost every moment and um and some some magnets and uh you know i would facilitate these conversations with these kind of guys to try to work out what was important and how we're going to do it and we'd build these tools and with them because we'd facilitated them with you know the idea was that we'd have ownership and then they would use them and you know then they wouldn't use them because they were painful <laughs> And um, yep. you just can't get away from the painfulness of that kind of stuff. So, so we're trying to create this, um, this env environment of people who are able to put a really good plan together, commit to it, hand it, you know, give it to the guys that are going to go and do it, get some feedback, make it better, get everybody really juiced up to do it, and then um and then have red hot go and then at the end of shift say this is what we did and what we didn't do and what we're going to learn from it and to do that plan do check act cycle but but the tools you're using mean that you can't actually ever get a plan that people will commit to because you can't collaborate effectively mm. across the departments to get to that plan and um so that's so i think i think that um there are there's are some operations out there which are which are having a red hot go at this using um, these kind of old fashioned tools and they're getting better results as a result of being able to, of doing that activity, but they could do it a lot more easily if they were to use a tool like, like ours, because the behavior is correct, but the, the tool should support the behavior, not make it hard, really.
Yeah, so I, I I think for me personally, one of the things that that hit home about what you just said was um, the fact that we might know where we're going to be next month and we have these sort of broader plans, but when we get into that detail, that sometimes is a bit ad hoc. Um, I was just, yeah. I think it was yesterday, having a conversation with our operations manager and we're, we're in terms of our knowledge management in, on the smart cap side and making sure all of the wonderful things we've learned over the years get shared internally. It's inevitable yep. when when we're on site with a customer, you can you can dust off your boots and go back to camp for the night, and then realize there's that one thing that you just completely forgot to do. And thank goodness you're there, and you can sort of cover it off tomorrow. And so yep. we've but but separate to that, we've got the world's most complicated Gantt charts that we can map out exactly how a project's going to go week by week. Yeah. But it's the, the detail of what we were meant to cover off that day or that meeting just didn't didn't get uh, always thought of. So. Yeah, that really right. hits home for me. Yeah, look, and, and it's it's funny. Um, one of the things we do in a in a project is we work out um, we work out who the supervisors are and what they what they're responsible for executing on a shift, right? So it's often often pretty yeah you know, reasonably obvious what what that is. Um, but we try to break things down so that each task is completable within the shift. And so, you know, in, in, a, in a mine planning system, appropriately, it says we need to develop, say, 45 metres between this, this, this heading and that, you know, in this heading uh, uh, in that direction. And you go, okay, cool, and there's a design and all that kind of stuff. So 45 metres is quite a lot, and you can't do 45 metres of development in, in one shift. So you've got to... You got to break that up, and each each you know each cut maybe four and a half meters, but you can't just take you don't just immediately take a cut. You've got to drill it, bore it, you know, load it, fire it, um, see, you know, shock crete it, support it, dig it up, yeah. you know, it out. You, you got all these things. So so it it's not. It might be helpful to set the intention of taking 10, 44 and a half meter cuts. But the guys who are going to go and do the work need to know how all of those individual processes, that tasks that lead to that cut being taken 10 times, um, work together because that jumbo may have to get moved somewhere else and then we're going to have to find another jumbo to bring it. But the, all of the logistics of that, and it's not just, it's not just the jumbo, it's the, it's the roadworks that might need to be done, the services that need to be brought up, the secondary support uh, you know all of the in the ventilation the j box might to be all these things that need to happen to make the work possible to deliver that kind of thing so a question i sometimes ask people is you know okay so you've got a um in a you might have a fleet management system in, a, in an operation so how much of the work that is done on a site in a particular on a particular open cut how much of the actual work that is done on site is covered by the fleet management system or the mine planning system? Mm. People will go, oh, maybe, you know, 70, 60, 70%. And we go, okay, cool. So is it ever the case that the 30 or 40% of stuff that's not covered by that system gets in the way of you doing the stuff that is covered by the system? And people like go, well, of course, you know, we couldn't do this last week because the roads were in a disastrous situation and we, you know, and that cable that we needed to move the drag line, that was, you know, 10 k's away from it should, where it should have been. And we had to move the, you know, the, the had to do this and all these kind of things that supervisors talk about day to day to day to day to day that, that sometimes get handed over, sometimes don't get handed over. They don't end up in a plan and so therefore the little things catch you out. And um, and so this is really an exercise, in, in my view, of making sure you get as much of the plan as possible into a system, so that the little things don't catch you out, and you can actually do the the mining and production activity that you you uh, that will deliver you the the financial result. Um, it's kind of like the look after the pennies and the pounds will look after themselves. I think is that old mm -hmm. saying. Yeah, that is a good one. Yeah. And so, and so uh, I want to I want to move on because I want to I want to bring safety into the conversation. It was part of uh, part of the the sort of banner title for today's uh, interview. And so, 
where my head goes when we start talking yep. about bringing systems in and uh, getting getting a lot more organized, becoming more productive, is kind of if we're more productive um, in the world of uh, truck truck and shovel operations, more productive means more miles driven, more loads taken. Um, in an underground, more meters, more meters wow. developed, and so forth. Um, but doesn't that then mean people are doing more of the types of work that expose them uh, to the hazards that are in the work environment? And so what I'm really, really asking is, is the net outcome of becoming more productive with tools like yours, is there the opportunity that we push our workforces harder than they are now and then make it perhaps less safe for them? Yeah, that's a, it's a really interesting question, that, isn't it? And I can remember... Years ago, I was in manufacturing and um, there was always this kind of, oh, does does running our machines harder and faster mean that we have poorer quality? Um, and, and so there's like a there's kind of this idea that, um, you know, you want productivity and safety and quality, but um, you can't have all of them at once. So if you choose one, that means it's a choice against the other. And I think that that's an unnecessary, it's, it's not a correct choice because the things that you, in my view, think what I learned in manufacturing is that the things that you do to improve quality are generally exactly the same things that you do to improve productivity. You know, so okay. getting, setting setting standards and knowing what to do and what the process is and and how to do it and making sure everybody knows what that is and then um it, you know that improves safety it improves quality and it improves productivity and um i i, I said i heard this actually from um i think it was an anglo-american some I heard it from someone at Anglo American a while back that they were saying you're seventy five percent more likely to get injured doing unplanned work than doing planned work. And I was like, wow, that's an interesting statistic. So I went actually looking mm. for research on it and I found this paper um done, I think out of um someone in, in Canada. And um and they, they looked at um workshops and compared workshops where where they, they compared a group of workshops where less than 75 percent of the less than 25 percent of the work was planned um at, versus a group of workshops where more than 75 percent of the work was planned and um and so and what they found is that you were uh, the the lost time injury frequency rate what i think is what they measured it on was sorry yeah the injury frequency rate was you were four you had in the place where things were mostly planned you had about three injuries per million work hours something like that and the place mm -hmm. where things were mostly unplanned you had about 40 injuries oh, per million work hours. that's that's more than three quarters that's right that's that's a, just a staggering number, right? And so, so when I so the reason I kind of pop, I pop this slide in there um, is when I went to talk to Andy Gregg years ago to get investment in our business. So he he's a, one of our investors. Um, he he I, I kind of mentioned this because he um, he's he's been a big safety um, enthusiast inside Bechtel when he was running the metals, mining metals business. And this is a guy that had 120,000 people working for him at, at Bechtel across the world. And he said to me that they did some research at Bechtel and discovered that nine out of the 10 injuries that occurred happened when people were working without, weren't, weren't following the plan or working without a plan. Wow. Um, and I was like, wow, that's extraordinary. And like, so that kind of supports that the, is. and I was like, so how does that happen, Andy? And he's like, well, basically, um, you know, people go to work and they'll do their pre-start and they kind of, they, if they, they, you know, they, they have the opportunity if the work is well planned to think through what machinery, what, what tools they'll need, 
who's going to do the job do we have the skills to do it you know all those kind of things right is it safe can we you know they'll do the step back take fives and do all that kind of stuff and and so they'll get organized and do the and think the job through and and do it well um but when when something changes or they don't have a plan then they then they and the, potentially the pressure is on to to do something that isn't well planned then that's when they don't use the right ppe they don't have a person that knows the job they don't read the you know the safe work procedure they don't use the right machinery to to lift the thing up they they kind of do mm. something and and that is, is as andy described to me is when people get hurt and so when you kind of look look behind the 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 the, the initial the the opening gambit of a an inspection about what how someone got hurt you know goes oh well they weren't wearing the right ppe or the machine that they used was incorrect or something like that so that's the first layer but the question about why comes down to um well you know the work they were doing wasn't planned and so that's that's what andy was is saying in this case um yeah no, right we're, we're due to that so you know so we we've we've shown in a lot of the work we've done with um with sites that you know you can get a 20 to 50 percent improvement in in the productivity of the actual work or the output of the work that's being done by getting more organized but if you can actually reduce your by doing exactly the same thing that we're talking about reduce the number of injuries by a factor of 10 then you know it would seem like a bit of a no-brainer to get a better plan in place wouldn't it uh it would seem like a no-brainer um uh which actually beautifully brings up the next thing i wanted to talk to you about um because when when I know what we do for a living very well. And so we're all about getting people home safe every day and making sure fatigue incidents uh, don't happen ever again. And yeah. with the track record we've got over a decade, um, and the, I guess from a, a really strong technology point of view, really, really strong operational experience in this space, it, it to me is a no brainer. Look at what our customers have achieved. Let's do this together with yourselves. We would say to a prospective, a prospective minor or transport business, and yet yeah. our biggest competitor doesn't seem to be this other fatigue related thing or this other sleep technology camera or whatever. The biggest competitor we seem to run against is just do nothing. Um, just don't do anything at all. And part of the way I can reconcile that to myself is whilst safety is number one, two and three in every annual report for every mining company, um, there's always the suspicion, there's always the, the back the back thought that productivity and 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 output and profits uh, have more sway in in motivating action. So yeah. all of that background to lead to the question: Do you ever see? As you're in the productivity space. Your your customers make more money when they use your stuff. Do, do you see do nothing as a competitor as well, and just stick with the old whiteboard ways? Yeah. Look, look we 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 certainly do, and and I think probably um probably one of our challenges and in, in, in anything in anything new your, your biggest issue is um helping to educate and and helping people to understand where you fit like if, so if we if we we're a fleet management system people would go oh fleet management system yeah i need one of those um i'm about to start a mine I, yeah i've got this list of five to ten different vendors i kind of already know which ones do which and how um, and the sales process is much more about electing a vendor as opposed to working out um, whether i want it or not right yeah so the the, the 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 challenge with um with starting a new business and 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 moving into a space which i think is is very underserved um, is that you have to help people understand why on earth they would want to do this in the first place and and so a lot of the conversations we have with people end up being not so much about whether we're we're the best um, solution out there 
um, but um, but much more about whether this is something they think they should do anything about at all. And and so I think um, you know I think that, that and there are a lot of people that are very happy with um, well seem to be very happy with using the spreadsheets and whiteboards that they spent a couple of million bucks on getting a consultant to give them right. So. <laughs> So I think I, I, I was I was um, I was right I was involved in a a document um, for the GMG on short interval control a little while ago and I I think I was talking to um, someone from Wipro actually about it and saying that um, I feel like there's 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 this sort of maybe this is because I'm a, originally a consultant I I generally come up with two by two matrices for everything. Um, but you know, there's this, there's a, a dimension in, in the world that we operate in, which is how how strong is your operational communications and technology? You know, your fleet management systems, your Wi-Fi, the communications tech that you've gone and implemented, yep. and how strong or weak is the operational management maturity? So, you know, have you got the daily plan to check act behaviours? Have you got a management operating system sort of process going? Do you do after action reviews and all that kind of stuff? And and I kind of you know, put this two by two together to say, you know, in the bottom corner, you've got poor comms and poor technology with a very weak frontline work management system, management operating system. Up here, you'd probably spend a lot of money on tech and wiring and all that kind of stuff, but you haven't haven't kind of converted that into the day-to-day -day disciplines. Over here, you might've gone and spent a whole lot of money on the disciplines, but you haven't spent money on the comms and up here you've spent money on, on and, and got got some maturity on both. And I, I, I feel like there's there's kind of three ways to, to, um, to go at this. And sometimes we find um, uh, with, a, with a, an underground gold mine in Canada, they had in their budget, um, let's go and spend some money on underground comms and technology. But they, <clears throat> at the same time, they had a consultancy in helping them with some of this MOS stuff. And fortunately for us, the general manager was a very, very keen MOS guy. And I keep saying MOS, and maybe that's probably, people have some negative experiences with MOS, and so maybe it's not a good thing to kind of bring up. But he was a big, big MOS. He believed in the idea of getting a really good plan in the hand of supervisors and making sure they could execute every day and then getting feedback on that. He, he really believed in that kind of stuff. So when we talked to him, he he was like, oh, he was going off. So I, I reckon the response curve to investment in this stuff, if this if that makes any sense, is more heavily weighted in the direction of improving your operational management maturity. Mm -hmm. So you get a faster and better response by spending money in this direction, and then you get better returns on your comms. If you go and spend a whole lot of money on comms, and then and then don't do the management maturity, you don't get very good results very quickly. So I think you're better to spend it in that direction. So what, what mm. however, a lot of people have been sold big kind of technical projects of Wi-Fi and lots of stuff. And so they've gone and done it this kind of direction, right? And then they come across. And so if you've done that, then it makes sense to come across like that. But um, and so that was what was what was the, the the guys in Canada were doing was going they go they were, they intended to go up like this spend a whole lot of money on some underground um, comms and then to probably slowly but surely improve their management capabilities um, and then another approach is to go like that um, spend the money on the consultants and then you know do it. But the, the thing that worked really well for these guys in, in working with us is that they were able to go kind of like that. So they're going from poor comms and technology to, um, to using our product with radios as a way to feedback where they're up to on site, um, but, to, but to both improve the maturity of their management behaviors and activities 
and also get a bit of technology that would support them to do that. So that now I think they're about to go and do some wiring up of the underground, putting some new tracks gear in um, to be able to see where everything is and what it's doing. So I think, so I think um, we sometimes we we we're arguing to people that if you use our software, you go like this. But there are a lot of other people sort of arguing that you should spend a lot of money on tech and there are a lot of people that are arguing you should spend a lot of money on consultants and i think that you know um those are not kind of do nothings obviously they are strategies to move you in a better direction than where you are but um yeah so that that but but someone spending a whole lot of money on a consultant probably means they're not going to do something with us although you know they could get the consultants yeah. to help us use our software you know yeah, so the do nothing's really just staying in that red box, and I guess yeah, I guess it's that's a that's less common in your space um, because everyone knows when they have poor comms and poor operational management maturity, something has to change. I guess um, it's just a matter of which direction do we go, and and it sounds like it looks like with this green arrow, the best path is uh, both. You got to you got to move both. Um, you can't I just think you pick get better one. result when you move both together because then you yep. you um you actually experience the improvement as you get the better information and you get then you use the information to improve the performance and that kind of stuff so but but like you know we we kind of i don't know if we coined this term or not but we 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 use it all the time called practical digital transformation um you know, it's it's possible to spend a lot of money on on um, on systems that help help go up here without getting a whole lot of real kind of tangible dollars back in your pocket um, as a result of doing it. Um, a good ROI. So we you know we talk a lot about um, just a really what what are some really practical changes that we can help someone make so that their team go to work more or in a more organized way and therefore get better results and that maybe that that kind of segues onto this measuring real it, ROI it, it does but beforehand i hadn't heard the acronym moss before and you said maybe it's not the best one to be using but has anyone surely someone's come up with the thing um, instead of saying a rolling stone gathers no moss, but a good <laughs> moss, make sure you keep rolling or something like that. <laughs> yeah, uh, that probably works, doesn't it? Um, well, a rolling mine gathers lots of mosses and then leaves them behind, perhaps. I think <laughs> you often see these whiteboards just sitting there, like stored up against the wall. Um, what's that? Oh, we used to, that's some, you know, we, we implemented that a couple of years ago. We don't use it anymore, you know. What about those ones over there? Well, you know, um, it's just really hard to keep that stuff going. So, yeah, <laughs> yeah, but good. Yeah. I'm, I'm glad you you mentioned ROI, and and I don't know whether the number you shared with us earlier uh, is sort of a a fair or reasonable average, uh, where you talked about businesses becoming, I think you mentioned twenty to fifty percent more productive in in the stuff that they do in terms of their output. Um, so. It, whatever the number is, call it 10%, call it 50%. Everyone's yeah. got some sort of claim to the benefits that they're going to see. And and um, and the example I always draw upon is this fantastic thing I heard, I think it was at a safety conference, where this manager said, if, if every single technology that promised me a particular percent in savings in fuel price uh, for my fleet uh, came true, my trucks would be producing fuel um, instead of using it. <laughs> And and that's yeah. just that's an extreme sort of uh, good levity on the thing of people don't believe the claims and so um, we see that of course when we we share real stories of businesses eliminating micro sleep incidents um, and reducing other things by eighty percent ninety percent and those are big claims. Do you see similar skepticism and skepticism is probably the wrong word. It's cynicism almost uh, when you yeah. talk about the achievements your customers have. Have had. Yeah, look, we we certainly do, and um, I guess it, it kind of depends what you seek in terms of validation from people. So we what when we do a project with people, we 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 tend to 
want to do a baseline. So we'll see what performance was and how it was variable beforehand. And then we, we track that as we go through and see, see what the changes have been. And um, we feel like we've succeeded when the mine, when we sit in front of the general manager or the mine manager at the end of the project and they go, yes, we've improved significantly. It's not just because of what you guys did, but you really did help us get there, you know? Mm. So they feel like, um, you know, there's always a lot of stuff going on to help the people to improve. And I guess on, on operations and um, we, we feel like we provide a kind of a platform upon which you can build um, better performance, if you like. Yep. So you're going to still see um, one of the guys, um, Glenn Britton, who's the head of underground ops at Anglo's um, coal mines said um, at the long conference a few years ago that the um, just getting on top of the day-to-day, -day, everyday little things that get in your way got, got rid of a huge amount of noise for them, which enabled them and, and got rid of a lot of the kind of this, what, what people in statistical process control call small special cause variation, which meant that their day-to-day -day variability dropped a lot which gave them the clarity to see that, you know, this particular shoot was costing them six hours of production a week on average. Hmm. So, so because they were able to see more clearly by getting rid of all the, the little rats and mice annoying stuff, and they used our product to be able to do that. And, and really it's, it's our product, but they, but they had a very passionate um, variance management process where every time they put a plan together, if it wasn't met, they, they talked about the causes of the variance and what they were going to do to resolve it. And there was an action raised and someone had to complete the action. So that, that behavior was not our software creating that behavior, but our software made it easier to see the variances so they could do that behavior. Does that make sense? Yeah. It does. Yeah. So, so, you know, the people still need to think about the problems that they're experiencing and do something about those and fix them. And that's where you get the improvements. But the software itself helps you to create the environment so that you can do that reliably day in, day out for eight, nine, 10 years and go from 60 wall hours a week to 110, you know? Um, so it, it kind of it can I can I just interrupt because it kind of yeah. brings up to me a question because we don't always get the plan right first. Sometimes we we have this sort of great on paper plan and then we go do it and then we find out oh that that let's do it differently next time. Do you find exactly. that people use in the same way that level of scrutiny you talked about with with um, looking at the variability? Do you find that people can go back and run the numbers and say when we did it with this set of steps when we did it this way? here was the outcome when we did it this other way, this was the outcome. Hey, great news, we've got a better way of doing it now. Yeah, so I remember um, witnessing underground a couple of guys trying to pull a pin out of a belt um, one day to break the belt to do a belt move. And I saw on one shift, I saw these guys, this is a silly example, use a pair of vice grips and then tap the pin out using the vice grips. So I was like, okay, cool. And then a couple of days later, I saw some other guys trying to break the belt and they were, you know, they had a claw hammer and they were hauling on the side of this thing and they couldn't get the pin out and it was a mess. And I was like, oh, mate, I don't know anything about what you guys do. But the other day I saw some guys with some vice grips tapping this thing out and it worked really well. And they were like, oh, I'll give that a go, you know? And so, you know, so that then, you know, I, we didn't have a mechanism by, to turn that into a standard way of doing it. But um, at that time, because it was before I kind of got involved in Fusion, but one of the things inside in, in, in our products is that each of the tasks can have standard work procedures um, against them. So, you you know, you've got a task. Some guys are going to have to go and do this job, which is called, you know, break the belt and um, and roll it up or something like that. And here's a little photo of how to do it properly or a diagram of how right. to do it properly. You know? so, so that that kind of, you, you, it's not 
we we haven't in our pro our product invented the way of doing that job. That's yep. for the people who are doing the job. We've we've simply created a receptacle for that new bit of knowledge so that that new bit of knowledge can be used every time someone goes to do that job. Do you know what I mean? Yeah, do, I do. That makes heaps of sense. Yeah, and, and I think that that, so, so we can't put our hand on and say, we invented this new process, but we can say we've provided you a platform upon which you can then make sure all of the best practices get collected and then used every single day so that your whole mind becomes best practice and all the things they do um, all the time. And that's really the experience, I think, that Murrumbar and Grassroot and these, these, um, some of these Anglo sites have, have gone on. And they've, they've then gone on and even further and invested in some great um, consultants that have got, got really into the detail of what that whole panel sequence advanced process, every single step of that, so that every single step of that is now wired into our system as a, this is how you do it, right? And so, yeah, fantastic. So, so, um, so we we didn't do that work, but we have the system that means that that work can now be very repeatable. Um, yeah, we're getting yeah. into this business improvement philosophy, aren't we? It's good. Like, I'm, I'm 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 enjoying it. Thanks. <laughs> oh, fantastic. <laughs> um, <laughs> I um I I'm just conscious of your time. You are a CEO, so yeah. you've got a lot of a lot of things to do. Um, but I I can't go a single hour of any day without talking about fatigue. Um, and I want to touch can, on can that. Can I just quickly? Can I can I just show a couple of pictures of the ROI? Bit? Oh, you can prove it. Let's go yeah. prove it. So you know the the this is a picture from a mine we worked in a little while ago. Um, and this was the variability of performance before they put fusion in so it's all over the place somewhere between you know doing a thousand tons a day to five six thousand tons a day um and you know they they've done lots of different things and they had some consultants in and around here to try and help them do stuff and we you know we put the we put the product in around here got it going in the space of a couple of months and then within within weeks or so of implementing they were you know, the variability had just, you know, crunched down to to almost, well, it's not nothing, but, you know, the variability had dropped substantially and the average performance had gone up. And I often kind of show these pictures of, um, these are some mines we've worked in. And this is, um, these are frequency distribution graphs of performance. Mm -hmm. So... <laughs> So sometimes, you know, they would do two meters in a shift, and other days they'd do 22 meters in a shift. Um, and, uh, you know, so this is before and after, the, the orange is before, blue after. And so what what's happened here really is because people have got systematic about the way we do things, um, the and they've got organized, so as somebody, one of our old, friend consultants calls all of the reasonably foreseeable screw ups have been planned out before people go to work. The the causes of bad days start to disappear. And so and so they, these days which were, oh, we just couldn't do that because the roller belt wasn't there or the guys hadn't put the ventilation in or someone hadn't hung the cable properly or, you know, all of those kind of things that should have been able to be organized before guys went to work, they start to disappear because you've got on top of them, you've planned them out, and those days end up being good days, better days. And um, and so we've, we've done this in Argentina, New Zealand, South Africa, Australia, um, Canada, um, all over the world, different cultures um, and different types of mining. Um, we've implemented the software and we, we, we're not the people that have got rid of these problems. These problems have been got rid of by the people using the product. They've yeah, right. through, they've got better plans and now they go to work and they get better results more, more reliably. <laughs> you know, some of the stuff, you know, this one happened within three or four weeks of implementing. This one happened, there was a story we got from these guys in Argentina. Um, uh, the, the tech services manager went 
away on his two week swing and he came back and he's like, wow, this is amazing. I, you know, two weeks ago, we were lucky to get three cuts a day and now we're getting seven, you know, how does that happen? And, and you know, the, the, the kind of story there is really um, probably summed up by this one, one guy we worked with many years ago said, we've increased wow. metres by about 30% and now we're hitting budget for the first time. We're just a lot more organised than we used to be. And, and um, you know, I, I think that that's probably, you know, so when you talk about getting an ROI, we, we have to talk, we, we, we have to sell our solution above the Wi-Fi project or the MOS project, the consulting project. And what we, what we try to do all the time is to sort of show people that, look, you know, here's a, here's a pretty quickly implemented, not very expensive solution that can get you really great results without any capital cost. So, you know, give us a, let us at least show you how this could work in your particular operation. Let us set up a demo and, 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 and show it to you. And um, if you, if you think that it could work for you, then, you know, you're, you're only a few months, you're only a month away from um, saying yes and getting something working with you guys, you know. Um, so that, that's sort of, so the, the kind of the question of fatigue. Um, uh, before that, you do, and I, I do yeah. like talking about fatigue, but before you do, can you scoot back to that first 45% uh, increase one that you showed, the one before this one? Yeah. Uh, there we go. So what I what I, I I look at data a lot and yeah immediately it jumped out the reduction in variance but each of those sort of peaks the really productive days or productive shifts or productive weeks there's if you ever sort of in my experience do a bit of a deep dive on those with say a production superintendent or something it's oh we had really that we, we had really good geology that particular thing or or yeah. um or we had one extra machine or whatever. Um, and then when you talk about the, the, the really bad shifts, the really bad days, um, it's the stories like you just gave, but it came to mind, it's almost never the same story. It's our old mate in the workshop put the wrong lubricant in, or, um, or yeah, the, the, we're still waiting on those guys to bring that thing. They thought we started tomorrow or something. But yeah, I've been in mining long enough to have heard probably hundreds of those one-off things, but because they're one-offs, there's, it's never, this is the 15th time I've heard it, we have to do something about it. It's just, hey, welcome to mining, right? And, yeah, that's right. Yeah. And so it sort of seems like, because there's no systemic nature to these, because they are one-offs, so many of these like just, we forgot this, we didn't do that, we did it in the wrong order, or we did it wrong. There's so many of those, that that's just the world mining's lived in, and it kind of I take it that if if we're planning properly, and we've got things in front of us telling us this is the next step, use this photo, do this, and and you've got your whiteboards talking with each other, those one-offs just happen. They either don't happen or they just happen heaps less, and like it's almost like a no-brainer again. It's immediately you get this result. Yeah, look, and that's that's it, right? Somebody once said, "There's no silver bullet. There's a whole lot of well-aimed lead bullets." And um, <laughs> um, you know, and and really, that's what's happening here is every time there's a variance, someone aims a really good action at that variance that kills it, and so then it shouldn't come up again. And when they've aimed it at that and they've shot it, they build that into a "This is how we do it." It goes into the system. And then you do it every day. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. Um, so, so they, they don't, they don't keep, it's not like whack a mole where the mole keeps popping back up. You know, you've whacked it and it goes. And then, and 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 if you to sort of, uh, yeah, here. So this is this is what this guy Sean McCarthy at one of these mines said once we'd implemented. You know, that we had an immediate impact on underground production, especially drilling. Many examples during the first couple of weeks where the control room supervisor is this guy here was able to identify an emerging issue and redeploy resources to minimize the impact on production. Pre-fusion, any one of those issues would have cost the mine half a shift of production from two or three bits a year. And so really what's happening here is this guy is all day, every day, looking at all the work that's being done and going, 
okay, can I move things around a little bit? Can, you know, this is what we're intending to do as the mine. These are the most important stopes we've got to get into. How do I make sure that all of our work is going on in the most high value place at any one time? Um, so that we've always got a plan and, and, and it's always done. So, uh, and, and I, I guess back to your point here, Dan, is um, if you can't identify, if, if things are happening all the time, you can't kind of identify what the individual kind of causes, then if you look a couple of layers below, you'll probably find a cause as, as Andy described at Bechtel, which is um, it's unplanned work. So therefore, it's not productive and it's not safe. Mm -hmm. So if you just yeah. you just have to kind of yeah, you know, oh, old mate didn't do this or old you know something didn't happen here. Well, the you know what is the actual root cause of that? Let's do a five wires on it or something and find out. Um, yeah, no, that's a uh, yeah, I'm I'm sold. That's a that's a convincing ROI because it's it's a uh, it's not hypothetical. Um, the stuff you're showing is real, but it's also uh, it makes sense that we can go from the the on the ground stuff that happens and join the dots all the way through to the business outcome, and there's there's no hypothetical in there. So yeah, I like that. Yeah, it's funny, isn't it? Um, some places you, you go and do a drive, uh, some kind of a if you're a consultant, you do a driver tree to say where all the kind of levers that we pull um, in order to improve production and you know where's it constrained and all that sort of stuff but um the reality is if you get people uh on the gear more regularly at the right place doing the work that they know that they should be doing um that's on plan and you know on the schedule then the mine will perform better and um the problem people have is really i think in a lot of places, just simply getting the right people in the right place, doing the right work every shift. And, you know, it doesn't matter how good your mind plan is, um, if you can't reliably get people into the right place delivering the work they need to do, it's going to be very hard to make it um, productive. Um, uh, yeah, make that work productive. Yeah, yeah. No, it makes sense. And so, yeah, just thank you for that. So back on to the fatigue, the fatigue that I love to talk about. So what we what we know um, is the we know the safety consequences of fatigue, um, but we often hear, and it always feels just anecdotal, that fatigued people are not as good at following procedures. They're not as good at following the set of steps that they know they're meant to. And so in the in the truck and shovel type operations, it's um, a fatigued operator is more likely to take a wrong turn or, or go to the wrong dump site and just make these mistakes right. that cost real money. And so my question to you, which was probably quite a, a difficult one, is is there is there anything that you see that gives that gives credence to that that fatigued people are less likely to follow process as well? That was yeah, the question. Yeah, I did struggle with that a little bit, and I, I don't have any slides off the back to to support it. But um, I do I do remember um, many years ago at, at an underground mine, I was I was on night shifts coaching supervisors, and um, and uh, you know just just trying to get the guys at the end of a you know ten eleven hour shift at six o'clock in the morning to to do the things that we needed them to do to be part of this management system of spreadsheets or these whiteboards was really hard because they were tired and they were sick of it and they wanted to go home and have a shower um and and so um you know i i think i guess when people are tired sometimes um things just seem a bit hard and yep. so if they couldn't find a whiteboard marker, then they just kind of wouldn't bother. And therefore, you know, there wasn't a line on the graph for their shift, which meant that the next guy couldn't draw his line on the graph, which meant that, you know, the whole idea was kind of, the whole kind of idea of tracking performance against the plan kind of got ruined. Um, yep. So I, I mean, a long time ago, I used to, I was part of a progress association and 
we used to run events on Coochie Mudlow Island in um, Queensland, and um, and people would complain about how um, you know no one would put rubbish in the bin after events, and you'd end up with this rubbish all over the beach. And I remember saying to someone, I remember kind of coming to the conclusion that everybody has like a a different radius that they're prepared to travel in order to put some rubbish in a rubbish bin, and and some people will walk from one end of the beach to the other because it's the right thing to do, um, and they'll do that. They'll do that when they're feeling good about themselves and when they're when they're not tired and that kind of stuff. But when they're tired and they've had a few drinks and they, you know, their their radius probably shrinks. Their radius right. for doing stuff that they can't be bothered, they don't really want to do, shrinks. And mm -hmm. so, so I think that what you find when people potentially when people get tired is they become less keen to do stuff that they don't really see the point of. So, well said. So they, the, the whole idea of getting them to do something like fill in a whiteboard at the end of shift becomes harder and harder and harder. And, and then, then, then the, the kind of whiteboard spreadsheet systems that you require, if it's a bit too hard, they just start to fall over. And um, so, you know, the job of a software tool like ours is to make it actually easier for someone to do the right thing. And um, yeah, you, you bring the rubbish bin closer to them to take your your metaphor and that's exactly what we did right so we went around and we handed out rubbish bags to every table <laughs> and you know like someone was saying oh well, we just need to make people put the rubbish in the bin you go okay you go around and talk to a whole lot of drunk people and tell them that if they don't put the rubbish in the bin you're gonna tell them off you know, how's that going <laughs> <laughs> the alternative is you go and give them more rubbish bins and then their radius is, you know, the rubbish bin is within their radius and you're fine. So I, yeah, I think, I think with things like this and, and people becoming more and more impatient with, um, with software and, and things as well, they expect it to be easy to use. You've always got to be on the front foot with um, ease of use and making things making things as easy as they need to be so that everybody does it. Yeah, that's a, that's a really good answer. No, I appreciate that. And I understand it's a curly question and it's something where we're looking to explore with some of the, that, that two by two that you showed earlier where the, the common path is to go up before you travel to the right. Uh, we've got a lot of customers who've, who've got this wealth of data that they've never looked at. They've got these high-tech systems in place to record and capture everything, but they've never never used it to improve anything. So we're starting yep. to work with them now to find those relationships between fatigue and kind of following procedures, fatigue and wrong turns in haul trucks, fatigue and excess brake activity in trucks and so forth. And so yeah, we're right. going to hopefully soon get an answer to this question of are fatigued operators less likely to be able to follow processes which then leads exactly to the conclusion of yours, which is we need to make things as simple as they can be um, so that people will do them yeah. and can do them. Yeah. Yeah. There's a, there's a really good um, book called Influencer, um, which talks about how do you create the environment around the person, um, with, you know, the, the individual, the peer group, and the environment around behaviors so that behaviors become inevitable as opposed to kind of optional um so maybe yeah i can share that with you if you're if you're interested we wrote a paper on that um for ourselves Definitely. it's a really good book um it kind of takes the idea of change management away from it being about the individual to being able to actually you know you don't just have to train people well what if you put all these things in the environment that makes it like the rubbish bags easier to do the right thing um yeah yeah i like so that a lot yeah I'll, I'll share it with it it's, it's pretty 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 good book yeah thanks paul that's awesome um so we have taken up more than an hour of your time um and i really really appreciate it um what i want to do is wrap it off um but i before we do thank you so much for taking the time to speak to us today um i've really enjoyed this i've learned a lot um and uh yeah, and and i think the people the people who've tuned in live uh have yeah had have learned a lot themselves but this is going to get posted on linkedin and youtube and so 
Uh, let's see those hundreds and thousands of people watch this over and over for me scratching my nose and drinking from my water bottle. Um, yeah. But before before we do head off, Paul, is there anything else that that you wanted to 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 get caught on video here that's worth saying to sort of wrap no, look, things up? I, no, I, look, I'm just um, I love talking about this stuff. I probably probably got the <laughs> um, yeah totally a process improvement kind of nerd, but um. <laughs> Uh, so yeah, yeah. If anyone wants to, you know, carry on the conversation, ask any kind of more pointed questions, and um, yeah, uh, look us up. Go on LinkedIn, hit me with a message, um, send us an email, make a phone call, whatever. I'm keen to talk. Um, yeah. Excellent. And look, I, I really do love the idea of the safety and productivity and quality actually being part of the same work you know like you should be able to improve all those three things at the same time by doing doing process improvement work on on um, operations so you know i think that that you could easily get caught in these kind of circular arguments about it's either this or this but it's not it's a false choice it's actually you get all those things by doing the same same good quality work yeah, yeah hashtag false choice that's a great way to put it paul I like it. Um, so, so what we'll do is we will make sure for everyone watching, um, we'll, we'll make sure that the details to get onto the CommitWorks website, uh, to reach out to Paul on LinkedIn, that those details are all in the YouTube video in the in the uh, description section. Uh, so if people want to reach out, and I hope they do. Um, yeah, because yeah. you guys are doing awesome work and I really appreciate your time today. Thanks, Paul. Good, awesome. All right, thank you very much, Dan, and thank you everyone for listening. Um, keen, to, keen to talk. Excellent. Right. Thanks again, Paul. Thanks. I'll shut Cheers. it off now. Okay. <laughs> Bye.